Good morning, church. Well, we are there. We are embarking on our Christmas journey. Uh, discovering Christmas are to, uh, at Westside. And so today we're going to talk about peace. And Jesus offers peace. He offers peace to us no matter where we are, no matter who we are, or where we're at in life. Uh, that's one of the reasons that he's come, is to give us peace. Let me pray, and then we'll get started. Father God, thank you so much uh, for the life that we have in Jesus. We thank you for the things that you bring that we would not have um, without you. And peace is one of those. Um, we can find moments of rest possibly, but we can never really truly understand peace without Jesus and with what he's brought so, Father, we just pray that you would help us to rediscover peace in our struggles today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Christmas is a big deal in Finland, I found out. They have a tradition there that's been going on for over 700 years. And any tradition that goes on for 700 years has to be a pretty big deal. But it's a real pretty basic thing. I mean, everybody in Turku, uh, Finland, comes together in this town square and you can just see them from a long ways off. And, and one of the officials, you know, that uh, is in the community will get up at this mansion and they have kind of a, uh, uh, that, what do you call that? The thing that you stand out on, um, that they would go out on and they would read the declaration. They would call it the Declaration of Peace is, is, a, is a title of this. A Christmas peace, Declaration of Christmas Peace. And so he'd go out there and he would read this. And like I said, it's not really long. Basically, it's just wishing everybody a peaceful Christmas and harmony among each other. And then it basically says, and if you mess with Christmas, you're going to be messing with us. And so there will be consequences to it. And I just think that that's really kind of a neat thing. You ought to Google that sometime, but it, it's something they have done every year, like I said, for 700 years. They want peace during Christmas. And I think that that's kind of a, a cool thing. A, w a good way to usher in Christmas is to remind us that Christ has come and we have peace and we ought to keep it that way. Um, the original Christmas was ushered in in a very dramatic way with a very dramatic proclamation as well. Uh, it wasn't done in a town square, obviously. It was just done out on a mountainside uh, or hillside with some shepherds and angels. But can you imagine what that would have been like? I want to read it to you in Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 14. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were, feared, they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was... The angel, there was an angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Can you just try to imagine what a glorious night that would have been? Just to have an angelic host of angels gather together and singing. And even though it would have been terrifying, what a, a marvelous thing it would have been. And really the takeaway for the night would have been glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Peace is what God wanted to bring to this earth. Peace is what he wanted to offer up to the people of this world. You know, Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, it says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And, of course, we know he's talking about in Jesus. In Jesus, all the fullness of God was in that man that dwelled in him. And then it says this, And through him to reconcile himself to, 
himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Making peace, that's what he came to do, is to give peace to mankind. So our objective today is just simply this, discovering peace in the midst of our struggles. It's a good place, I think, to start as we begin to walk into our Christmas season, is just to try to discover or maybe rediscover peace in the midst of our struggles. We're on this journey today, beginning today, and we're going to walk through this journey in the next few uh, weeks as we go into Christmas. You know, Advent is something that's really cool. Advent is a word that means coming or arrival. And it's the season, it, it marks expectation, anticipation, awaiting, you know, a longing. Because that's what was going on in the midst of the world at the time, right? Like when you go to your, your Bible and you go to the end of the Old Testament, Malachi, and then you go to the next book, it's, it's Matthew, and you know that that is a dividing from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. And we know that Jesus is the one who is responsible for dividing the Old and the New Covenant. But sometimes we forget that there was a lot, many years, like 400 and some years, right, between the Old Testament and the New Testament of just God's silence. Like we don't have anything written about that time. There would have just been a longing for God to just speak. There would have been a lot of struggles and people just asking God to show up. And it just seems like God was silent. But God wasn't silent. He was just wanting there to be a longing, an anticipation, a desire, a waiting. You know, one of the things that I like about Christmas is watching the kids. Do you? I mean, I love the anticipation, the buildup. It just seems to come along with Christmas because the kids are just waiting and longing and anticipating the wonder about what that day is going to be like, you know. I can remember my mom asked me the other day, what was my favorite Christmas? And it's a pretty hard thing to come up with, and I still really haven't come up with, like, the Christmas that was my favorite. But I know that what, what my favorite part of Christmas was, was that. It was just the, the wonder and the longing and the anticipation of this celebration. I remember wanting so bad to know, like, what my dad was playing with down under the tree the day before Christmas, right, on Christmas Eve. Uh, he would always try out the gifts, and we were like, what do you think that was? What do you think that noise was? One time we peeked around the corner, and he's down here playing the pinball machine that they got us. <laughs> uh, but I think that, that that is one of my favorite things about Christmas. But I do think that the struggle, though, is is to connect that anticipation that we have with kids to connect it with the anticipation that is meant to be for Jesus. You know, to just making sure that we bring Jesus into the season and to connect that, that longing and anticipation that you have is the longing and anticipation that the world had for Jesus coming into this world in the first place and just trying to make that connection. You know, Advent offers us an opportunity to share in the ancient longing of the coming of Jesus. And not just the longing of the coming of Jesus, but also the longing of his second coming is part of it. And just anticipating what it's going to be like when he appears again. It's going to be a little terrifying, I think, just like the shepherds must have underwent. <laughs> But I think that there will be an angel that will try to calm us down by saying, fear not. I don't know if that really works. But evidently it works enough for him to get out what he needs to say. But just an anticipation of that each, each time too. So each week we're going to focus on a different gift that God gives us. There's, thing, there's things that we have that we only have because the creator of the universe has provided them. And peace is one of those. But also hope is one of those, isn't it? Only God can give us hope that we have, or at least the type of hope that we have that's everlasting. 
And so we're going to look at that. We're going to look at joy. Only God can give us joy. The world can give us moments of happiness, but the world cannot give us joy because joy is something that can happen in no matter what circumstance you're in. And the last one we're going to look at is love. And these are gifts that God has given us, and they're things that I want us to, do, you know, to discover in the midst of our Christmas. But we're looking at peace today. The shepherds. You know, so often we look at the shepherd's story, and, and we come up with like some conclusions or some takeaways as we look into that. And one that we hear often is like, because we ask the question, so why is it that God went to the shepherds? To an obscure place with just a few people and make this huge announcement of the birth of his son and invite them to the manger. Why is it that God would do that? And some of the conclusions that we come up with is, well, he loved shepherds, right? I mean, the patriarchs were all shepherds. Abraham was a shepherd, all the way to Amos was a shepherd. But in between that was David was a shepherd. And, and uh, Jacob and the, and the 12 tribes of Israel were shepherds. It just seems like that it was something Moses was a shepherd. It seems like something that God is fond of, is shepherds. So... Maybe that's possibly, that's our conclusion, right? It's, that's possibly why he went to the shepherds, because he liked shepherds. His favorite people were shepherds. Sometimes we conclude that God went to the shepherds because he wanted to go to the lowliest of the low, the people that everybody overlooks, the people that if you couldn't get a job anywhere else, you could always get a job watching sheep and being a shepherd. And God went to them so that he could communicate to the world, everyone is included in this good news that I bring of good tidings. And this peace is offered to everyone and nobody would feel overlooked. And those are all great takeaways, but I want to offer one that we probably don't hear often. Maybe you haven't ever heard it, but it's just simply this. It's in Isaiah chapter well, this, this is actually maybe not the passage. This, let me just read it to you, and then I will tell you. But Isaiah 53, 6, it says, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. But one we don't hear about much as we look at the shepherds and their story, is that God went to the shepherds because it's the best way for God to communicate to the world that the Lamb of God has come into the world. Because the Lamb of God, that announcement of the Lamb of God, where would be the best place for that announcement to be taken? For the world to understand that he is truly the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Don't you think it would best be offered to the shepherds who take care of lambs? That there might be peace with God. I think this would have been John the Baptist's best favorite perspective on why God went to the shepherds. Because it's John who said when Jesus was walking along the coast there that day, looks towards him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You know, Jesus entered our world to fulfill his identity as the Lamb of God, the one who came from heaven to earth to be our sacrificial Lamb, the one who could take away all of our sins because don't you know everybody understood what it meant to sacrifice a lamb before God? And everybody understood why, how important that was to sacrifice because everybody understood the sins that they have committed against their God and that something had to pay the penalty or we had to pay it ourselves. And God was trying to communicate to the world 
Finally, it is time for the Lamb to come to take away the sins of the world once and for all. His death did away with ever needing to sacrifice another animal on behalf of our sins ever again. Isaiah 53, it goes on to say, I'm just going to go ahead and read 6 again. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to be slaughtered. And like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. We looked at a passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 26 in our men's study on Wednesday that was the trial. It was the actual trial of Jesus, this, this one who came as a sacrificial lamb but grew up. And now it was come time for him to be that sacrificial lamb. And he's in trial before Caiaphas, you know, right after the Garden of Gethsemane when they take him to this trial. And Caiaphas, the high priest, is questioning him. They're all questioning him. They're trying to get him to somehow uh, give them a reason to kill him. And that passage of Scripture just says that he was silent. He would not open his mouth, just like it was prophesied here in Isaiah until they directly asked him, are you the son of God? This is what it actually says in Matthew chapter 26. I'm going to pick up at verse 63. But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of, of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robe and he said, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered. He deserves death, they said. Then they spit on his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? And just as Isaiah said, he was a lamb that was led to slaughter. But that's what he came for in the first place. God announced it to the shepherds at the very beginning. The lamb has arrived. And I need some shepherds to come and witness the Lamb. This is one of the reasons, I think, that God went to the shepherds. I think all those other things that we have concluded and brought up in the past are all true too. But I think this is probably the most significant reason that God went to the shepherds. is to announce that the Lamb is here. And a Lamb needs a manger, not a house. And a lamb needs shepherds at its manger. And God orchestrated it all. And I want you to just take a moment and just let that sink in. Because isn't that just kind of like mind-blowing in reality? Isaiah 53, verse 5, it says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us what? That brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. God looked down upon us and he saw our struggles. He saw our wounds. He saw us needing to be people who receive healing. And the only way that we could really truly receive healing is through Jesus. And Jesus came to give us peace. His resurrection made it possible for us to be fully restored in a relationship with God. To be fully brought in peace with God. 
Shalom is what the Hebrews called it, right? And it, it means a completeness, a, a, a connectedness with God again that's in, in harmony, a sense of peace. And it's all of those reasons that the angelic messengers announced the birth of, of his son. You know, God's favor is not based on human standards. It's not based on what we do. We don't have peace because we do something to get peace. We have peace because of what Jesus did to give us peace. And so our, our peace is just something that is, happens because of what God brought into the world. It's a gift of God that he lays before our feet. And the way that we have it is that we accept it. We receive this peace from God. And so peace is yours. It makes sense that the number one greeting from the Jewish people is shalom, peace. Not because they can give peace, because they are just acknowledging the one who has brought peace and can give peace. Or at least that's how we should see it. How is your Christmas season going? I know it's just barely started. How is it going? How, how, is it that, how does it typically go? So if we were just to be honest for a moment, what would we say? Hectic? Busy? Kind of overwhelming? Frantic? Here and there? Nervous? Anxious? Or maybe we would say more things like this. Lonely, overwhelming, disappointing, relational conflicts, pressure at work, illness, job loss. You name it, we probably have it represented. Does, does peace sound like during this time of season so far away it's hard to really think that we could actually have peace during the holiday season, the busiest season on earth? Is it just a nice thought for a holiday? But if you're going to get it, the only, thing you, the only way you can get it is if you turn on Hallmark or something like that and watch it come out and develop in somebody else's life. I suppose what I really am after more than anything in this sermon is just that try to help us understand that when we need it, Jesus always shows up to give it. When we really need it and we're at our wit's end, and we are crying out to God, God, help me find peace. I believe that what we will find is that Jesus has already shown up. And we just need to discover it. To discover peace at Christmas. Let me show you. Luke chapter 2, back to the shepherds for a moment. And then I will illustrate this. Luke chapter 2, verse 15, it says, When the angels went away from them into heaven, so this huge proclamation, scary proclamation, wonderful proclamation was finished. The angels went into heaven. And this is what the shepherds said. The shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And when they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. I think there's some things here that, that I want you to see. And the, and the main thing is, is that they, the proclamation caused them to actually move. We have to go see this thing. And they moved with haste. They hurried along. And what they found is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, and they found peace. 
You see, peace is always found at the manger. It's always found at the foot of Jesus. You're not going to find it looking on your TV set or buying your gifts or, or trying to, you know, be prepared and work this out, you know, like Martha. You're not going to find it there. You're only going to find it at the foot of Jesus because he is the Prince of Peace, is he not? Let me illustrate this with something that's probably the most recent thing that has happened publicly in our world today that I think, man, if this ever happened, could you ever find peace ever in a situation like this? Some of you probably know, if maybe not all of you know, that a few days ago, I think it was Wednesday, a FedEx driver abducted a seven-year-old little child from their driveway. And he took that little child, and I don't know what happened, but the result of it is, is he killed her. A little seven-year-old. Beautiful kid. I meant to have a picture just so you could see this beautiful kid. And I think it was Friday, or was it Saturday? Friday, I think, night, they discovered the body of this child. And you think, man, there is no way peace is going to come into that family. How? How in the world would that happen? Carrie has volunteered. I asked her if she would, and she, she was going to read. The grandpa wrote something yesterday, and I think it was something that I think we ought to hear. You can come up here. What are you going to do, babe? Okay. I can't quiet my mind, and I have to share this. Um, a friend just asked me the other day if I believe God speaks to people. I happen to know he does, as he is speaking to me now. This flesh, this man that I am, is angry, and I want five minutes alone in a cell with the psycho that took our Athena away from us. But there's a soft, gentle voice in the back of my head telling me I need to forgive him. This flesh man wants that psycho to burn in hell for all eternity, yet that gentle voice continues to tell me I need to forgive him. This flesh man hopes he re remains blind and deaf to the message of salvation and never... <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> Oops. It never sets foot in the same heaven that I in my heart know my darling Athena resides in now, and yet that gentle voice persists. Why, you ask? Because hate is, the, is a powerful force that will take root in my soul. God wants to protect us all from that hate. Hate is the gateway for the evil we see growing in the world today. If you stood that man before me right now because of the hate that's trying to root itself in my mind, I would probably kill him. Then that hate would root itself in my heart, and I would be destroyed. That gentle voice is the Holy Spirit of God speaking to me right now. He's reminding me that my Savior Jesus willing, willingly laid himself on a cross and died in my place to reconcile me to God the Father, but also that he did that for all of us, even this man that my flesh so hates at this very moment. I am a sinful man, yet I've heard this voice before, and I miss hearing this voice. If I allow this hate to consume me, that voice will fade and eventually be silenced. Then that ugly spirit of hate will have succeeded, and that's why this gentle voice persists to tell me I need to forgive this man. It's for my protection and my peace. It's to set me free from this hate and allow me to continue to hear God's gentle voice. There's not one ounce of my flesh that wants to do this or say this, but my spirit has heard God's voice, and right now, while tears flood my eyes, I declare publicly that I forgive this man. Hate will not win. I hope my family will understand and that I don't have to, have to do this, that I don't have to do this for the sake of this man. I do this for the sake of my family and myself and to honor the voice of God who is giving me the strength to say this. I do this to honor our precious Athena who knew no hate. This man won't be allowed any real estate to live in my brain. He belongs to God, and God's justice will be done. Love conquers all and forgives all. 
Today I choose love and hate loses. Thanks, Gary. One of the things that he said is that it's for my protection and my peace. I don't know how, you know, uh, Grandpa could write something so powerful in the midst of that. But at the same time, I know exactly how Grandpa could write something so powerful in the midst of that. It's because Jesus is that amazing. He's that powerful. His peace that he has brought is a peace that can transcend all understanding, is what the Bible says, right? All understanding. People in the world will not understand this, but you and I who have come to the the foot of the cross, who have come to the manger as the shepherds did, and have looked into this Lamb of God, knows that he has the ability to take away the sins of the world. And that he has the ability not only to give us peace here, but to give us an anticipation and a hope of a place that is nothing but peace. Psalm, I want to read something to you here as we conclude. In Psalm 85... I found something that I don't know that I've seen. Maybe you guys have. But it was just wonderful for me when I read it this week. Psalm 85, verse 8, it says, Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, to let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, the glory may dwell in our land. That glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. And I just kept thinking about that, that verse 10, right? Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. I decided to look at other versions of the Bible and and I, I read, I don't know if it was the message or what, but it was just talking about that that steadfast love and righteousness, they meet out in the street. There's a, there's a destination, a location where they encounter one another. And righteousness and peace, they kiss each other in the street. And it just, like this wonderful thought in my head, just clicked to me. It was just like, that is what happened. That is what the shepherds got to witness happen. Is God coming to the earth with his, his righteousness and his steadfast love? And there's this embrace that he does with his creation, this kiss of love. And it's where righteousness and peace kiss one another. It's as if God was saying to the shepherds, come, you got to see the kiss. This wonderful kiss. The kiss of steadfast love, the kiss of peace that God has for his creation. See, it all comes back, no matter how you want to try to explain this, it all comes back to a person. Jesus. And Jesus is peace. Jesus brought peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, which is what Isaiah calls him. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, for he himself is our, he's our peace. And long before his arrival on earth, the 
the, the prophet Isaiah wrote these words. Chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Discovering peace in the midst of our struggles. No matter what's going on in your life, no matter how hectic it gets during this season, if you'll just pause and come to the foot of the manger and look in on this Lamb of God, I have no doubt that God will fill you with his peace. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much that you have brought something so wonderful to us. This is a gift that you have brought to the world to offer to the world. We can't even imagine what the family Athena is going through, and we pray, Lord, deeply for them. But we know that you have already showed up at their door, and that somehow, Father, they have seen, or at least the grandpa has seen, the lamb that you have brought for such as times as those. You have seen what a mess that we are and how it is a world that is without peace, without Jesus. But with Jesus, we have peace. Father, help us to just cling to Jesus during this season. And to see him for who he is, the Prince of Peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.